Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome wherever you are in the world. Uh, we're just uh, getting started. Uh, nice to see you all, and uh, I hope you're doing well at this uh, interesting time. Uh, today, we've got uh, quite a, a fun topic, which has got all kinds of different directions to go in. Uh, let me know if you can hear me in the comments, and uh, we'll uh, talk shortly. And I want to hear your tales as well as we go through. So if you have any other things to add, then definitely get involved. Uh, talk on the chat. Uh, tell others if the, you're watching and you think they might enjoy. Uh, but uh, we're going to have some fun today with heraldry and with all kinds of things. And we're going to talk about clans and tartans and why your clan tartan idea um, might not be what you expect. And that coat of arms that you bought from uh, Blackpool Pier isn't maybe perhaps the one that you uh, should be looking at for your family history. So I see some hellos. That's great. Uh, I see Sue, Michelle, Richard, Jean. That's great. Okay. So let's have a bit of a go around this and let's talk about um, you know the whole thing. There are a lot of, um, what would we call them, uh, myths, uh, misnomers about uh, clans and tartans and coats of arms that we assume when we get started in family history and it takes a little bit of experience to realize that we're not quite looking at the right thing. So this is something where all of these mistakes that you may have made along the way are mistakes that other people are kind of leading you towards. So there's no shame in having you know uh, made these kinds of different uh, mistakes. Uh, and there's, if anything, something to be proud of to say that you've uh, now learnt a little more and you know exactly you know what the truth is. So I see lots and lots of people from all over talking about, um, you know, saying hello and the weather and things. That's good. Um, Roscoe, Illinois, Lakeland, Florida, Mexico. I see some people talking about their coat of arms already. Uh, I see uh, uh, Joan is saying good morning from Mexico. She's looking for the Muirhead coat of arms. So we'll talk about that and perhaps that one in particular shortly. Um, and uh, I see other people coming in. So there are enough of you. Let's get started and let's start with coats of arms. We're going to go through all of this as we move along. Um, first of all, um, what are coats of arms? And heraldry comes from all kinds of different places. Um, it is, you know, originally it, it was to identify people in battle or in tournaments. Um, you could identify these different combatants because they were wearing you know, maybe suits of armor. And it would mean you'd have to have some kind of design or color to make sure you knew who was who. Um, and um, they were hereditary. So they were passed down um, from person to person through a family. But that's slightly different from, you know, it being denoting a family. It's passed down through individuals. And there are a few organisations that arose in, in England and Wales and in Scotland particularly um, to regulate the use of coats of arms because they relate to the nobility or they relate to uh, very serious things in the aristocracy. So, uh, of course, they need rules and they need rules to be applied. And so there's the College of Arms in England and Wales and the Court of Lord Lyon in Scotland. And they take it quite seriously because you have to be granted a coat of arms or you have to uh, prove that you've got a right to use a coat of arms. So uh, there have been a number of fairly high profile cases, in particular uh, one uh, former president uh, <laughs> who you might know of, who uh, used a coat of arms without permission and uh, found himself in hot water. There are other things you know, that was in Scotland uh, relating to one of their golf courses. Um, these uh, institutions will uh, you know, keep an eye on how these things are used. They're almost like trademarks for people, these coats of arms. So they are quite big and they are quite, um, you know, uh, important to get right. And that's one reason why we're going to try and get it right. There are a few things to think about. So um, they've got lots of these different rules, as we say. And the big thing which we point out is that they're individual coats of arms. They're not family coats of arms. You might have seen the, you know, I've used Clark as an example, the Clark coat of arms that you might have got with maybe a history of a surname or something like that. And surnames arise in lots of different ways. Some of them are patronymic. They come from, you know, the name of a father and they're passed to a son or something like that. Sometimes they're descriptive. It might be someone who, like you look at brown, maybe it's someone who has brown hair or something like that has taken this surname when surnames were uh, coming into place. And so not all Browns are related. And same with Smith. If they're occupational names, you've got Smith, Archer, Fletcher, uh, Miller, etc. 
um, not all millers are related. There are groups of these families and they've descended over time, but you know, they're not all genetically connected. And the same way, not all millers will have a miller family crest that they can use and say, this is it, this is us, we are the millers. Uh, these individuals, perhaps John Miller or Simon Miller or Toby Miller or anything else may have uh, distinguished themselves somehow and be granted a coat of arms. And that then is the coat of arms of Thomas Miller and his descendants, not of the Millers. And so that's how that works. And so when you see, as I said, Clark, that coat of arms, it's not your family crest. It, there is no family crest for your family. This might be a family crest for your ancestor, and there might be a family crest you can use, but they are slightly different. Here is an example. I went and had a look in an armorial. We'll talk about those and what they are shortly. But this is just a short list of some of the many Clark coats of arms. And they're, again, given to individuals. So we know it was a fairly common name. So we have many of these people, uh, different counties where they originate, and they're different coats of arms. Uh, you were given one. And that's why maybe when you go to website to website and you'll see someone give a, a coat of arms, why they're different. Uh, one's not wrong. They've just picked one and said, this is Clark coat of arms. And that's not quite right. A Clark coat of arms. It might not be your Clark coat of arms. And that's the thing to remember and how we think of this. So armorials are the way that we can find out more about coats of arms and uh, all of the crests and things involved. Before TV or any way we could show these, the uh, coats were written down in a really descriptive way so that a herald could recreate the coat of arms on the other side. They could read this book and they could redraw this. So everything has to be written exactly so that it can be completely copied from someone who's never seen this before at all. And that brought about quite a set of conventions. Those conventions are really very specific. Uh, they're often in French, and they have very definite ways of doing things. And this is called uh, blazoning or blazoning. Um, there's a bit of a debate as to how you pronounce it. Um, and those books that they're in, these armorials, are what we can use to do a bit of family history and to find out more. A uh, great way, again, of finding out about our ancestors. Uh, and we can talk about that again shortly. But armorials are the place to go if you really want to find out about your family's coat of arms. They list things in a certain order. First, you have the field or the background. Then you have the charges, which are the things on the shield that make it exciting. Then the brisures, and that's the difference between the different descendants. If you're maybe the first son, you might have a different brisure than uh, the third son. Uh, and that's little extra bits that are added. Uh, and then there are augmentations, which are little modifications that you may be granted for certain reasons. And this is a really huge topic. This is a massive thing that would take, I don't know, 10, 20 hours to go through every single one of these different kind of things. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some examples and we're going to go uh, and describe what these things are in a bit more detail and um, work through a couple of uh, versions ourselves. But blazoning or blazoning, um, if you really want a big session about this, um, then um, definitely tell us in the comments and we'll, we'll do something specifically on that. Um, and of course, there are lots of resources online that will help you and we'll have indexes and glossaries of what these things are so that you can get started right away and you don't have to wait for us. So you start with the tincture, which is the color of the field, which is the background. Uh, there are only a few to choose from, so it's not so difficult. And they're written in French, so you can use a glossary helps you quite a lot. It's very simple. Keep this with you. I love the fact that this is recorded. You can go back to it if you need to. We have the metals, or an argent, or for gold, an argent, uh, silver. So we have there gold and silver there. You'll see that. Then the colors. We have azure for blue, gul for red, purple for purple, sable for black, and vert for green. Uh, slightly less used, these. These are the stains. The stains uh, were named this. They came about slightly later, and they were named stains, uh, and it was supposed to be, or, or some people said it was a stain on someone's honour to have them used, which isn't really true, and it was sort of made up. But because of that strange reputation, they weren't used that often. So there's Murray, Sanguin, and, and uh, Tene which are that sort of purple, royal purple, um, uh, red, which is sort of blood red, and the sort of, um, uh, what do you call that, a beige. Uh, and then you have a few more that appear, but they're much rarer, but they're still worth knowing. Carnation, Blue Celeste, Red Ochre, Buff, um, uh, Sondre, or in German, uh, Eisenfarbe, um, Orange, Rose, and Copper. 
Uh, not so often there, but these are the things that we cover when we look at our background and we move from there. And in black and white, because these things often weren't in colour when they're passed around, colour printing back in this time was difficult, it was quite expensive, we had to find a new way of describing what these colours were when we couldn't even see them. And that is when hatching comes apart. So um, from the 1600s onwards, you might find crests and coats of arms that are hatched. And so when you see that drawing, you can tell the colour without even knowing by seeing it in colour. So you can see here the dots for ore, it's completely blank if it's Angel. Um, we've got, if it's red, we've got the lines going down. Blue, lines across. Uh, verd, so green, uh, lines in a diagonal way. And then sable, or uh, there we go, noir. Uh, we have um, the, that sort of heavy hatching there. So you can get a feel for those colours, even in those black and white documents. And many of the printed records that we look at for our memorials are in black and white. There are some wonderful examples, and some hopefully I might... Um, you might find their way onto Farmer Pass soon that are hand painted. And so they're obviously a little rare and a little more expensive, but you have painted versions of different coats of arms that are beautiful to see, absolutely wonderful to look at. There's also something called tricking, and it's an alternative to hatching. Other people use this. Uh, everything is blank. And then you have little numbers and letters that are letters, not numbers, sorry, that um, describe what these colors are so you have o or or for or um so that's your gold a ar or arg for argent your silver um and then g or gu for ghoul ssa for sable black uh, and b azure and um, there is a slight difference here so we have b instead of az like you might think with well, this pattern for b for blue because um if you do az then that might get confused with Argent and everyone might think that's a different colour. So um, they've thought this through as they've gone through and we can see that example there. We can see the colours without actually knowing by looking there and looking at the letters that are included in this and that's tricking. There's also something called diapering, which is a little bit of elegance added to certain coats of arms and crests. You might see them. So this shield has been diapered. The background is still white or silver or argent um but it has been diapered to make it look more elegant and cool uh on this uh, wonderful stained glass window but that wouldn't be described in the uh blazon because it's not part of the crest it's just something to make it more exciting then we have ordinaries um ordinaries are um the ways that the shield is divided you'll get this description with their color um we see chief fess Pale or Palais, uh, Bend, Bendlet, Chevron, Paul, uh, Saltire, sometimes called St. Andrew's Cross, Chief and Pale or Palais, uh, Cross, a base uh, per Chevron throughout, two bars, three pallets, three Bendlets, Bend Sinister, Pile, and three Chevronels. These are just a few examples. Again, there are wonderful glossaries online that can give you more, and it's really useful to have a glossary with you because I studied this for my master's degree and I still uh, couldn't remember these if you threw them straight at me, uh, possibly without a little bit of help. So there's no shame in doing that. Some of the more common ones, perhaps, but some of them can get very, very ornate and very, very uh, interesting. Um, but this division will then also be coloured. And so you'll have the colour of each division as well in the blazon. So you'll be able to then decide and look at something and see if it's yours. So let's put this into practice here. So how do we describe this? So first, we talk about the field, which is the background. So it's blue. So it's azure. We've got that. Then we've got this ordinary or charge. And we've got here. So all the lines and emblems, anything on there, we then describe that. And this one is nice and simple. We saw it was a yellow strap. So it's a bend, or we've got the color there. So it's a gold thing there. So we've got that. So there we go. So it's a bend, or. Uh, and then azure, a bend, or. That is it. That's blazon for this shield. And that's the family. It's a scrope family. When we have that, we can do something with it. And I'll show you a bit what we can do later. But this is how someone would read that and be able to recreate this shield using that extra knowledge. Any way arms are different, you'll have variations on this field. Um, they're described after what we've just done, uh, and they're followed by the way the shield is divided. You might have seen sometimes they've been quartered or halved, and that can happen when families intermarry. You might keep the old arms together. If you look at the coat of arms of the, the royal family, you'll see there all of the different parts of their origins and places that they rule uh, represented in that coat of arms. And charges are the really cool part. They're the exciting stuff. They're dragons, fish, shells, anything you can think of. Every single part of their pose or their arrangement is listed in this uh, blazon because 
it has to be recreated. Imagine you're speaking completely to someone who's never seen this before and you want to write down exactly how to recreate it. Everything's got to be in there. So all of this is described quite in a lot of detail. These, you might know some of them. You might see the uh, the English lion. There's three lions in the top corner, the Scottish lion, a few others, a Flemish and some more. Um, the lion there uh, stood up, the Scottish lion. You might remember it known as the lion rampant. It's called the lion rampant because of that position it's in. It's uh, rearing up, so it's rampant, and then it's always facing the same direction as well. Uh, you'll have the color described, and then that will mean someone can recreate it as well. But that red lion over there, uh, the lion on the red background, the English lions, aren't rampant. They are slightly different, uh, and they have different descriptions for all of their different um, uh, poses. So here um, we have a different one. Uh, we have, I think that's lion puzzle. Um, but then also we then describe which way the lion is even looking at you. So this is a uh, passant gardon, which is uh, looking towards you rather than away. So there are lots of different things, and they're all described to try and make sure that you get exactly the right thing uh, in this coat of arms so we can see. Um, there are lots of other rules as well. So we always, when we look at things like quartered shields or anything like that, we go uh, left to right on the top row and then the same on the bottom row. Um, additional elements come afterwards sometimes, so they can be described, but not always. So when we look at these uh, blazons, we'll see shield, and then sometimes you'll describe, you know, you'll see the crown, we'll see the helmet on the top, the mantle, which is the name of that wonderful um, fabric or uh, cloth or, you know, any kind of um, feathers that come down from the, the helmet itself. And, of course, the uh, top thing which you'll ever be you know it could be as we see here we've got a, a dog's head or an eagle or bull's horns uh, the motto which of course we always enjoy a good motto you can see that maybe something family motto that's been chosen to be passed down and the supporters which are the things that hold the thing up so you might see if you remember again the british uh, royal family they've got the lion and the unicorn representing scotland and england on either side those are the supporters and they can also be described so those granted arms are written into these armorials and all those descriptions are written out. And you can find or you could check your granted arms by looking in an armorial. You can put a surname in, you can browse through. There are so many, um, I go to archive.org for these. There's a huge collection. Burke's uh, are very good. There's a, a wonderful one by uh, Burke uh, that I use a lot. Uh, and that's uh, an armorial of all of Britain and Ireland, I think. Um, so you can look for your surname and you can see the different families that have been granted coats of arms and look for the name of maybe the originator or where they are, perhaps the home they live in, if they're you know middle class uh, or aristocratic, you'll see that. And then you'll be able to see their coat of arms. Um, rather than, of course, if it's got a county, it doesn't mean all those in that county or anything, as we said before. Um, but you can also reverse it. And this is the exciting bit. This is the bit that I find most useful for family history, because this is probably the way I think you most come into contact with these and with that skill of being able to blazon. So you can find the names of coats of arms you see. And I'm sure uh, I know um, I went with Ellie uh, just only, uh, it was about a week ago maybe, for a, a healthy walk uh, around some of the cemeteries of Edinburgh. And there are all these coats of arms on these graves. And perhaps the inscription has worn off a little bit and we're not sure who's there. Perhaps we don't know what's going on. Um, we need to find a way to identify these people. Or maybe we find our ancestor and we find this coat of arms and we want to find out where that person came from because we haven't got where they were born well, we might be able to connect them to another family by using this. So we take a look at this. This is a uh, shield that's found on a uh, gravestone. And let's imagine that we can't read it at all. So we have to look at what we can see. Um, and so we can describe it. So we can't see any colors, so we can't really use that. But we can see a cross. We can see four pellets. And then we can see more. So we can see a leopard paw, uh, which is called a gamb in uh, heraldry. Um, and they're holding another pellet on this crest at the top. So we can use that and we can type in wonderfully on archive. You can search the whole book by typing in words. So you can type in your phrase, you type in your words and you can search through and compare all of these different coats of arms to try and find the one that matches the description that you're looking for. So here we go. So I found the Clayton from Marden in Surrey, the Baronets uh, across uh, Sable. So we see Argent, so we know it's a silver background uh, and it's a, a black cross uh, between four pellets. So we've got that. 
and the crest is a leopard's gam, so it's a leopard's paw, um, erased and erect, so that's what it is there, um, grasping a pellet. So that's what we've got, and we've also then got the motto, virtus in actione consistit and quid leone fortuitous. Uh, so now we know where that family's from, and we know the name of that family. So this is the use that we can do when we come to these armorials, and that's what's really exciting, and when we look at family trees and crests, and it can get complicated which is why I said we might need some more time to go over this in detail. This is a very famous example, but um, these shields can be quartered and quartered and quartered and keep going, and each part of this can be blazoned and described so that someone who's never seen this can recreate it in its entirety. Don't panic. This probably won't happen to you, but you can see in all these different elements that have come together and all of them you'll be able to read and find out. But by using, I said, some of these glossaries, you'll be able to start to pick out these terms and start to do your own sort of blazoning and pull out these things. And then, so if you go to a cemetery, and even perhaps if you're in a cemetery and you don't remember these things, you can look online for these different terms and find out what you're looking for and try and find it. Uh, sometimes even just Googling the description of a line that you've got might get you to uh, a, a version of an armorial that's online that might help you. So that's used in England and Wales and Scotland when we look at coats of arms by the nobility. But there's another kind of uh, nobility uh, that has captured the imagination that we should really think about and talk about. And they are Scottish clans. And uh, so Highland clans are the go-to. We think of Tartan, we think of those, we think of Highlander, we think of all these sort of things. But clans are a shared identity. Um, as well as shared descent. Uh, and they're recognised by the Court of the Lord Lion, which we talked about earlier, the Scottish um, version of the College of Arms. And they have a clan chief, usually. And we'll talk about why not soon. But we're going to debunk some of those myths about clans as we go now. So they had a clan chief and they controlled land. Uh, usually it was a clan chief who owned the land and usually they had a, a castle they were in or anything like that. But having that surname doesn't mean that you're a descendant of that clan chief. Lots and lots of these people who lived on this land, and this could be a large amount of land, um, took the chief's name for lots of reasons. They might need protection or sustenance, or they were just tenants, and uh, they thought it might get them in with them. There was lots of different reasons, or you know, it was a very obvious way to identify yourself as being part of, of this group and by being you know, together with that chief. Um, and when surnames came around, they had to be starting being used. Then this was where the surname came from. So it doesn't actually denote that you are related to the clan chief if you have that surname. You just have that surname because you have some kind of, you know, perhaps on that land or anything, any connection there. A lot of them were just simple tenants and they weren't aristocrats, they weren't anything like that. Um, and there are crest badges as well. Um, these were worn to show allegiance to clans. And you might see if you've been to Edinburgh, there are many, many shops all the way down the Royal Mile selling things like tartans. Uh, we'll talk about tartans soon. Uh, crest badges and talking about clans and everything else and getting you very, very excited. Um, they're called crests sometimes, but they're not really because a crest we've seen and um, there aren't really any of those in Scotland. They're more like this. So you've got the heraldry inside. Um, but um, this is a crest badge. Um, they're protected by Scottish law. And if you're not entitled to that heraldry, so this is the clever definition and the difference, um, then you're allowed to use it if you have that strap and buckle around it, because that shows that you're uh, you're giving your allegiance to that person. You're not the person who has that crest. You're not using it in that sense. And if you are the person that has a right to that crest, then you can use it with just a plain circle. So you can notice that if you see a clan chief or anything like that, uh, then they will use the same symbol, but they will use it without that strap and buckle. And so you can buy them as that, but they aren't crests at all. And uh, there are our Midras clans as well, which is a term you might have heard. And they're clans that used to have a chief, perhaps, but that chief uh, either is in dispute um, or um, they've simply, the line has been become extinct. So they're dormant. Some have reinvigorated. There are a number in recent years that have found a new clan chief and elected them and re been reborn in that sense. Um, but um, outside of that, the clan, the crest badges that you can see are usually the last one known. Um, and uh, that's quite a big important differentiation so uh, that again is for a family that's now extinct so that's definitely not you know your uh, crest but it's something that you can then say you claim allegiance with by using that strap and buckle 
and now tartans and all this will come together uh, and we'll see as we run through as we break a few more myths as we go to uh, steps are important as well we'll talk about those as well which involve clans as well as tartans i'm showing you uh a still from the movie braveheart uh it's a nice thing i i enjoy uh braveheart it's a fun film um but they didn't uh, play uh, safe when it came to history. They didn't let uh, get the truth get in the way of a good story. Uh, so there's something very wrong with this image. And I wonder if you can think what it is. I wonder if there's something that you can think of um, and spot. And so here we go. Well, of course, there are no kilts. At this point in history, these people wouldn't have worn kilts. Kilts didn't come about until the 15 and 1600s. And so uh, all of this is a romantic ideal. Um, there's nothing. I mean, you could also argue that they're all painted their faces with blue saltires and Andrew's crosses, and that also didn't exist. And I could spend, again, probably another hour talking about why uh, <laughs> that uh, Braveheart uh, didn't get it right. But I'm going to get off my soapbox. I think that's a dangerous thing to get started. Um, but uh, so there were no kilts at this time. Um, and uh, so if you think of your ancestors wearing a kilt, that's not what they would have worn. And there are also trousers called trues. You may have seen those. They're traditional. Uh, they're worn by Highlanders and they were banned by uh, the Dress Act 1746 in the same way as kilts were. We'll talk about why that was shortly too. Uh, 1782 was the next time they were allowed to be worn. And they're often worn in the military. And here comes the common myth here. Um, there's a misconception that trues are lowland clothes and um, kilts are highland. That's not the case. Lowland regiments in the army wore trues, even though early on, when the army was first formed, the lowlanders hated the idea of bagpipes and tartan because they thought that was foreign and savage and they didn't like it because that was a highlander thing. Um, but um, the Highlanders insisted on having that stuff. So that was the separation of the British Army. But they wore their kilts and trues, and the distinction began to emerge in the 1800s when the Highlanders started wearing kilts and the Lowlanders started wearing these trues as their Scottish military things. So this kind of uh, romanticisation of, of Scotland started to happen. And then this is filtered over into real life, into you know, outside of the military, where this idea that Lowlanders have to wear trues and Highlanders wear kilts, which isn't quite true because um, they're both Highland uh, implements and um, most people in the lowlands have now started to identify with the kilts being a very Scottish thing and it's just a national thing and so they, they wear kilts quite a lot and those people in the highlands are very keen on reclaiming the fact that they wore trues and wearing trues as well so anyone can wear whichever no one's going to chase you don't worry but there's no myth that each one has to uh, wear you know either one or the other it doesn't matter you can wear what you enjoy and so I know some of you asked for a picture of me in tartan uh, and in a kilt, uh, so I thought I would oblige just to uh, <laughs> get, get you stop you from complaining. But um, that's me on my graduation day of my master's degree, and so I was in Glasgow, Strathclyde University, and so I wore a kilt. And the question that I'm going to ask you is, what's my tartan? Maybe you know. Maybe you can find a way. Maybe you have an idea. Um, you might have something in mind uh, people put a lot of stock in tartans they think tartans are so important they will wear their tartan they will keep going um and there's a whole industry around it again if you've been to edinburgh everyone as soon as you get off the plane there'll be people trying to sell you your tartan scarf or selling you a kilt that you can take home everything else there are online indexes there are old books that describe it there are organizations that are meant to further that cause of tartan and keep going and there are so many myths and new traditions that have arisen um, through this. And uh, that's the, the thing that we're going to look at, those traditions which aren't actually that old. Um, and that's the thing that we're going to look at. There are a few different types of tartan, a few different colours. Um, and when you might find the tartan, um, there are, you might see a little definition between it. So um, first of all, there's the ancient tartan. So the ancient tartan, is um, something that is supposed to be before these dyes uh, were used very much. So um, they are what tartan might have looked like back in the times when they used vegetable and animal dyes. So that's the sort of mid-1800s and before. It's a little faded, slightly lighter and softer. 
Then we've got the modern tartan, which is the same, but that's after the chemical dyes come in from the mid 1800s. So that's brighter, more vivid. Uh, and then we have the weathered tartan, which is a sort of an estimation of what tartans might look like after they've been in the rain, the sun, the wind. An assumption that these people centuries ago would wear these tartans day in, day out. They didn't have that many clothes. This was their heavy gear. This is what they wore all the time. So it would be faded. It would be exposed. Then we have hunting tartan and dress tartan. Hunting tartan, of course, are lots more greens and browns to blend into the forest while they're out hunting. And dress tartan was inspired by women's fashion in the 1700s. Uh, they wore wraps, often with white and cream-based tartans. That sort of came in. Used a lot in highland dances, things like that. So you'll have these different versions of the same tartans. And then, of course, people will talk about colours having meaning. You might see this description. Uh, colours in your tartan representing different things. Uh, red tartan, sometimes people say they're battle tartans, and they're supposed to not show any blood. It's all an invention. It's all a modern thing that's just come about. Um, back in the day, there was no uh, pay attention paid to this kind of symbolism of different colours. It's something it's very romantic. It's very nice. It's very pretty. Uh, particularly from about the 1950s onwards, a lot of American and Canadian towns and cities and provinces who had a tartan made um, went in with this and picked tartans and designed tartans because you can design a tartan even now. Um, and uh, made it descriptive and made it so that the green in the tartan represents the grass, the blue represents the ocean, uh, lakes, rivers, yellow might represent crops, fields of wheat and things like that. So um, it's it's wonderful, but it's not uh, something that our ancestors ever thought about. And one I know of represented the mountains and the fog on the water. It's, it's nice to hear, but it's ancestors didn't know anything about that at all. And now some of the big rules that we're going to uh, listen to. And uh, some of them you may have uh, uh, been keen on before. You may have insisted, but let's go through them. Firstly, royal tartans being off limits to non-royals. You might have heard that one. The Balmoral tartan, other things. That's a convention, but the only people pushing it are the people that sell tartan because the royal family don't have any opinion at all. Um, the same uh, with the idea that a clan chief personally owns a tartan and you have to ask their permission before you can wear it. The only people pushing this are the people that make tartan and they have a bit of a vested interest in having things exclusive. So it is a bit of a myth uh, and uh, you can wear any royal tartan if you like. No one's going to chase you. No one's going to knock on your door. Um, secondly, if you don't have the surname, you can't wear the tartan. So uh, we're going to go into a bit more detail in a second about that. But um, in the clan system, the Lord Lion does say that membership's technically by surname of a clan, and clan tartans are worn by those who profess allegiance. But there's no rule that says you have to wear your family name tartan. You can wear any. And the same ties in with the idea that some tartans are free or universal. You might have heard like Black Watch tartan or uh, anything like that. This is a tartan you can wear no matter who you are. doesn't matter because all tartans are free and universal. You can wear whichever one you like. That's not a problem at all. But there are a couple of tartans that we may have to tread a little carefully with. Tartans are still designs, so they can be copyrighted. And one that I wouldn't go near unless I bought it from the proper place because I wouldn't want to be sued or anything like that is Burberry. You might recognize this Burberry Czech, very famous international design. And of course, there's a lot of money to be made in designer clothes. And so you might find counterfeit versions that's out there. Uh, if you buy Burberry Czech from somewhere that isn't the Burberry company, uh, then of course, that's a different thing. And that's not a convention. All the things we've talked about are conventions, things people say, well, you shouldn't do that. This is a law infringing copyright is very different and so i would very much avoid that and the same with some of these copyrighted things there are things like this so this is the princess diana memorial tartan and a few years ago there was a set of shops in edinburgh that were selling this tartan uh, they just made it and were selling it and um, it's designed for the memory of princess diana and it's sold to raise money for all the charities that she was part of and so um it was a little bit uh would say very naughty to sell this tartan uh, outside of that because of course the charities weren't getting any money and uh, so this design this copyright design of course then it's uh, very quite immoral as well as being um, you know against copyright so there are a few slight exceptions of things that you wouldn't do but outside of that we have a little bit of open season and so when we look at what our ancestors might have worn uh, then we have a few questions to ask um, so our ancestors uh, lived in areas around Scotland and um, tartans were made by local weavers. Um, these places, uh, you know, weavers were making these certain patterns and they would just make 
their fabrics and then the clothes will be made from this and that will be it and all the people who live nearby all walls of clothes that that weaver made uh, and so they started to sort of be a little more obviously uh, connected and from that area because they were wearing the same sorts of colors and the same patterns in 1703 there was a writer martin martin and he wrote a very large travel book about scotland it's great to have a look if you take a look for him i think the book is available online for free as well um, but he describes his travels around scotland and what scotland was like and he he noted himself that as he moved to these different islands and regions of the highlands you could pick out the different patterns and he could say that these areas had different things nothing to do with people's surname nothing to do with anything else but people in certain areas had different patterns and that's down to the weavers and things like that. So as we can see, uh, you know, my own uh, tweed that I've got here, etc., it has a certain pattern because a certain weaver has made it uh, and this kind of thing. So that's where things have come through. Um, and uh, it started to get things together. Um, it was where people bought their clothes. You know, we talk about this. Um, and um, tartans, so example, um, Frasers, who aren't Frasers, would still be wearing the, the Fraser tartan because they bought it from the place, which is, you know, the, the weaver that the the Frasers also used. And it started to get associated in this way. Uh, and it wasn't much later, uh, until much later, till the tartans began to really standardize. And you might recognize this painting, and this is from the Battle of Culloden. Uh, and so the Battle of Culloden, a uh, very famous uh, culmination of the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion. And we all associate tartans and all Scottish things with the Jacobites. And we all have an ancestor that was there, supposedly. And if they were all there, then the battle would have gone a very different way. No one's ever on the government side either. They're always uh, Jacobites. Very romantic uh, story as well. So it's something that's nice to have in the family. But uh, finding the truth is a big thing. We've got those records on Farmer Pass. We'll have to do a Jacobite session at some point. That will be quite exciting. Uh, and this shows off a lot, though. And this is accepted uh, you know, th at the battle that there weren't really any clan tartans there. But there were lots of people in tartan at the battle. And there were uh, observations of soldiers wearing tartan. But it just wasn't their tartan it was just tartan and we can see these eight highlanders in this painting wearing more than 20 different tartans between them uh, they didn't use tartan to identify themselves at all they used things like ribbons on their hats uh, and that was the way that they could tell each other in the battlefield the only inscription uh, the only exception of this was in the army um and um that was where you might have a regimental tartan and that came about in the mid 1700s um but outside of that it was open season and then of course when the rebellion happened, there was the 1745 rising and the end of the 1745 rising, the government didn't like Highlanders very much. They were uh, a little bit dangerous, mad, bad and dangerous to know, as people say, uh, causing rebellion after rebellion and something had to be done. So they passed a load of laws to try and stamp out the culture. They banned Gaelic from being spoken. Um, they passed the Dress Act, which meant tartans and kilts weren't allowed to be worn. Uh, they tried to forcefully assimilate people. They used other things. They used uh, rules to stop people from uh, carrying arms. Um, the act of prescription meant that people couldn't carry weapons in the Highlands. No Highlanders could own weapons. And the Heritable Jurisdictions Scotland Act 1746 took away a lot of the rights that clan chiefs had to try and break this whole thing. And this stayed in force until 1782. But then we became a little bit tartan mad a little bit later as we are now. So what happened? The Highland tradition revived itself in the 1800s. A lot of poetry and literature started to create an inspirational image of the Highlander. And as even now, we have this romantic view of Highland culture. Uh, very, very useful at a time when you want people to uh, fight in the army and fight for the empire and all kinds of things. When you have this noble warrior race on your doorstep that you can conjure up and you can talk about in great detail. And there's one big event that changed the game completely. And this is the exciting one. Okay. So this, if you've heard of it, is the visit of George IV to Scotland. In 1822, he became the first reigning monarch to visit Scotland in 171 years. The last one was Charles II at his coronation. And it was to distract a little bit from the rise of radicalism. And we had the 1820 radical war uh, just a little bit before, which um, unfortunately was there was a James Cleland who was one of the ringleaders of that. So perhaps um, you have my ancestors to thank for, for the fact that we're all very tartan. That's a story that we have to dig into maybe more. Um, but um, Walter Scott was quite famous and popular at the time, uh, the wonderful poet and author. And so he designed this wonderful pageantry 
And most of it was designed. It wasn't uh, something they pulled from a history book. It was created specifically to create something big and wonderful. And he convinced the king to wear a tartan kilt. He wanted to connect the king to the Stuarts and to the Jacobites and say, look, I am as much a king of Scotland as any of those. I'm the real true king of Scotland. And this is me showing it. So the king wore this wonderful Highland dress. We can see this. I say it's a stylized image over there. Um, and uh, that's an important thing to remember. Um, gentlemen were off and brought all the great and the good of Edinburgh were brought this grand ball where the king would be there. And they were only allowed in if they were wearing Highland costumes. So there was a mad dash for getting hold of Highland gear. Lots of people trying to find uh, their Highland connections and trying to find their kilts and things and uh, trying to get hold of all of these uh, tartan fabrics to go to the place where everyone had to be. They had to be seen in this place because being in a ball with the king, especially when the king hasn't been here for so long, you have to get yourself in. If you want to be there, you want to be seen and noticed and be part of high society. That portrait is quite a stylized picture. Um, you might know if you know about George IV. Um, I remember when uh, Jem Bolden and I went to um, the Freemason Museum in London, saw his chair. Um, it's uh, a little larger than you might imagine if you've seen it yourself and things like that. He was quite big. He was a very large chap at this point. And so his uh, pictures were very romanticized. And um, so he actually, if you look at his legs, you can see his bare legs. You couldn't uh, because he was wearing pink pantaloons. Uh, they were uh, made to be flesh colored and they were made to hide people from his uh, rather uh, wide legs uh, that were considered a bit of an embarrassment. And uh, the kilt also, uh, which he was wearing, was a little bit too short, which is one of those issues um and i know sometimes we wear we wear the trues uh particularly in the highlands they wore the trues for winter and when it got very cold because um, we all know about uh you know the highland traditions about how you should wear a kilt and it can get very cold uh so it's pretty understandable but uh um it was a little bit too high uh, and so some people were complaining that it was a little bit too high and there was one lady lady hamilton dalrymple she said well He's only with us for a short time, and we see so little of him usually. The more we see of him now, the better. Uh, and that was the way it was uh, brushed off. Um, but um, lists were drawn up um, that linked as many surnames as possible to all these clans while this was going on. Um, just regardless of there was any actual historical connection to these surnames uh, to get people into this ball with their tartans and everything else the king arrived in scotland he had these gallic gifts given to him he had that kilt he was wearing and um there were things like septs as well which well, we talked about clans a little earlier we didn't go into them but septs are supposedly a sort of uh, a, a branch of a clan and they were drawn up often at this point and they're quite new and quite interesting and different and they were made up a lot on time just because they needed to be you know, uh, connected. There was no huge reason. So you have, say, Taylor is a sept of Clan Cameron, and that name is an occupational name. So all of the Taylors, which are all over Scotland and England and everything else, now have a tartan to wear. But of course, there were tailors for every every clan had a tailor in their lands and everything. So it's a very strange, tenuous connection. And I know particular of one. I know the Cleland Tartan, supposedly, and in, in, when you look in some of these books, is McNabb because that was a sept. But then uh, if you look into the history, it all came from one tailor's shop, which made so many clans, septs, or so many surnames, septs of clans of McNabb because they had loads of extra McNabb Tartan that they had to get rid of. And so they decided to tell everyone that they were a, a sept of McNabb so they could use up all of that fabric. So don't pay too much attention to those seps. It doesn't matter as much. Um, and what's my tartan then? So we looked at this and we said, you know, look at this. And we've gone through all these different bits. And um, we are looking now at me and my kilt. And I wonder if after all of this, you know, I've worked out what my tartan is. You may recognize the tartan itself and you may know. Uh, or, of course, um, you uh, might not. And so this is the tartan I chose. I chose Aaron Mist. Why did I choose it? I chose it because, first of all, I like the name. I've got family in Aaron, and uh, that's quite a nice connection to me. Secondly, I like the colours. I think the colours are pretty nice, and uh, that's quite fun for me. It, it, I think I looked all right. Uh, and uh, sec uh, thirdly, I like tradition, patriotic tradition. It's quite nice, this idea of this sort of national dress. It's great. And even if it's not as old as first assumed, it's quite a great thing to have 
uh, with you and start to uh, you know use as your own and, and just to feel a little prouder of your Scottishness. So the big thing I'm getting at with this, you know, we can do other things as well. You can get yourself some Harris tweed. Not that I'm you know <laughs> sponsored or anything like that. Uh, if I was, that'd be wonderful. Maybe I'd have a free suit. But um, I wear Harris tweed a lot. So um, because these tartans aren't connected to certain families. These tartans are often made worldwide. Perhaps they're made in uh, some kind of factory in another country or continent. If you buy something like Harris Tweed, which is protected by copyright and by law, by Act of Parliament, it's woven in the Hebrides. So all of those islands there, you know that there are Scottish workers making this and it's their livelihood. Um, and you're supporting Scottish business and you're putting money back into those remote communities that really need it. So, uh, tweed making was in a massive decline for quite some time. And uh, because of the resurgence of um, these kinds of clothing, um, there are now new apprentices being trained and the population is growing and the industries are thriving in a way that they haven't done for generations, which is a wonderful thing to see and hear. And it's all because people are excited about Harris tweed handbags, uh, cushions, everything you can think of there. Um, and so that's a great thing to support. So that's why I'm keen. Um, and uh, I know someone will say that it's uh, it's just me that's keeping them in business, but there are more of us, so don't, don't worry too much. So what I'm trying to get at here is if you have one of those scrolls with a coat of arms and it makes you smile, or it makes you happy, um, and it says, you know, Clark family, and you've got your coat of arms, if you like how it looks, Keep it. Um, don't throw it away. We live in a world where things that make us happy should be treasured. Uh, it might not be your coat of arms, but family history is about stories. And we've now, with this little bit more knowledge, we can talk about that story, about how we uh, progressed as a genealogist. And we learned that that wasn't my coat of arms, but I did go and have a look and I did manage to find the real one. Or I found out we weren't, but I found something even better and even cooler, which is really exciting. And family history is all about those stories. Um, and you can talk about that you know, when people see it. You can say, uh, you know, when you've got that kilt, um, you can say, okay, I wore that kilt to my uh, son or daughter's wedding or my own wedding, uh, and I loved it. I was really proud. I thought it was great. I was showing off my Scottish connection, everything great. It, it was a, probably a beautiful day, and you've got some great pictures, and there's nothing wrong with being proud of uh, being Scottish or anything else. And uh, if, if you identify with this, tradition even though it's relatively new that's fine our ancestors might not have worn these tartans but they wore something similar a pattern uh, and it's a connection to that heritage and that's what's important um, but if you're looking for a kilt or a, something like that for your wedding or you want a tartan scarf or anything like that go to a, a shop that sells tartan and don't worry that you only have six or seven to choose from and they're not your family or anything like that enjoy them Show off that you're Scottish, show this off and, and enjoy every part of what that is, because that's what matters. And you're not going to get a knock on the door. You haven't broken any laws. Enjoy all of them and all of them for what they are, because that's what matters. And that's what the stories are. So that is a quick summary. As I said, I'm, I'm kind of fairly glad that we didn't go um, too far into um, uh, blazoning, because I think we, we would be here uh, tomorrow. Um, but um, we've gone through a little bit of a, a summary of all those things and hopefully broken some myths down. So I'm going to now take a look at some of these questions and see if we can get some more done in, in the little time we've got left. I see um, Patricia saying your great grandma was Marin. So I'm sure you're probably a cousin of mine then, Patricia, because there aren't so many of us. Um, but uh, hopefully maybe some more Aaron records soon, some wonderful new Aaron records in that Scotland monumental inscription collection too. Um, I see uh, Jen say not sponsored, but I should be Harris Tweed. Well, fingers crossed who knows i, I can't uh, go for that too much uh, but uh, that would be quite exciting wouldn't it um and uh, there we go so pat is saying they were given a kilt skirt made for them in the ogilvy hunting tartan for their 18th birthday so it's supposedly tradition maybe a more recent tradition and as we said these uh, identifications and these allegiances that have come through um they may be modern and said as long as we understand that our ancestors didn't wear them and that's the bit that we know, and that's the bit that we we know from a historic perspective, um, then there's nothing wrong with anything else, and we've got some wonderful memories with those things. Um, so it's uh, it's great to see, uh, you know, uh, Joan is saying uh, that they have uh, family from Scotland and Shetland. Um, they love that history, and that's it. It's about those connections, about knowing that we have this great Scottish tradition, all because of one very clever marketeer, Sir Walter Scott, and all the things he did. And that's kind of almost as exciting a story as them being worn by our ancestors in the 1200s and sitting at Bannockburn and Stirling 
building bridge, isn't it? So it's quite good. So definitely still be very proud of everything you form and everything else. Um, and uh, there are lots and lots of different tartans as well. I see um, Anya has put a link for a panda tartan. I don't know if that's a tartan related to the animal or anything else, but you can register tartans even today. There are lots of tartans that are designed. Tartans for clans and families that didn't have tartans have been designed in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, I found a Clellan tartan myself, and that was from, I think it was designed in the 70s by uh, someone who's trying to rejig this whole idea. And um, so I know my ancestors have never seen it. They've got no idea of it. But um, if that gives me a connection to it and I want to do that, then brilliant. But of course, you know, I, I'm fine with any as long as they're pretty, as long as they're good, because that's the way that I look at it. But it's great. Um, so I see uh, a few other little bits. So uh, uh, Ellen is saying thank you. Uh, they'll take that coat of arms in the 1929 genealogy book with a grain of salt and do some more research. That's the big thing. So um, research that coat of arms if you see it. I'm not saying it's not your coat of arms, but I am saying it might not be, and it probably isn't. So go through and find the person who was given that, those arms, which are always in those armorials, and then go back, go forwards through time and find their descendants. And maybe you connect, and maybe you do have a right to use that or to display it, or maybe not. Uh, but you'll definitely have found a lot of stories in the way as well. And so let's see what else we've got here. Uh, a Harris Tweed kilt, uh, Graham has said. I mean, this is one thing that um, tartan, uh, up until later on in history, could be plain. So uh, we talk about, you know, plainer colours or patterns or anything like that. And um, it did happen. And our ancestors may have worn just plain colours. Uh, of course, not so much uh, some of the very expensive colours. You'll notice that there are very few tartans with yellow in um um uh, because uh sorry uh, you notice very few color uh, tartans don't have yellow in um as we look in the earlier sort of things and very early sort of patterns that have been found uh, because yellow is really cheap to produce purple is very very expensive uh pu purple is usually reserved for royalty because it costs so much to make but yellow is made from um how do we describe this um horse urine so um there's lots of that around and so you can make uh, yellow clothes very easily in yellow fabrics so um there's plenty of muted kind of uh, you know browns and greens and yellows because those are the things they had around to dye things with they had plants uh, they had moss they had all these different things and they could do that really easily so that's quite important and um so um here we go i'm trying to go through in our last bits um hazel said as a scot living in scotland i love your mild rebuking of those who get worked up about tartans and clans and crests i think this is the thing that i'm sure many of you have have been back hame and you've come to scotland and you've uh, got excited about this whole thing and, and i would get excited about the place excited about the history excited about everything but don't get too excited about finding your uh you know, your clan thing and, and asking, you know, I've seen many times in forums and things, what is my clan or what is my tartan? What tartan can I wear? Don't worry. Relax a little bit more. Enjoy the journey. Find your own family stories. And that's the big thing. And so there are a few questions of people asking about, is there this tartan or that tartan? Um, there are named tartans and they may be more modern, but your ancestors wouldn't have worn them. And so if you can't find a tartan with your surname, don't worry. Wear another. Wear one that makes you feel proud of being Scottish, and that's the big thing. Um, and so Daphne asks as well, my Cameron grandfather's come from the Isle of Skye. Can I wear a tartan? I was born and bred in the south of England. Yes. Uh, there's nothing saying that you have to be even Scottish to wear a tartan. There are Welsh tartans. There are Irish tartans. Um, there are American tartans, Canadian tartans. Um, there are Indian tartans. There are other things, Cornish tartans. Um, if you want to wear things like that, Go ahead. There's nothing stopping you wearing it. It's a kind of profession of allegiance nowadays, ever since Walter Scott. And so if you enjoy it, if you like that, and if you have a connection, then enjoy that connection and definitely wear those uh, clothes and wear what you fancy. So uh, let's take a look and see what we've got here. Some more. Um, I see uh, Matthew saying the the right thing. Braveheart is known for its errors, full of holes. It is... Um, I mean, I would start with the accent. That's something that hurts a lot. And uh, yeah, Jenna's heard me 
uh, talk about Braveheart perhaps one too many times. It's one of those uh, films. I do like a good epic, and I think maybe one time uh, I, I haven't talked to Ellie about this yet. I keep meaning to, but uh, we talk a lot about the great historic films and TV series and things that we enjoy, and it'd be really good to have a session on all of the historic series and movies that we've watched, uh, and um, not how historically accurate they are, because um, that'll do terrible things my blood pressure but um the ones that uh, maybe we could learn from or ones that might give us a bit of fun historical context or even just the ones we enjoyed because there are hundreds uh, there are more all the time there's one that came out relatively recently on netflix i know a lot of people are talking about there's others um and then there's some wonderful movies as well that are around um and especially while we're indoors what better time to start a series so we're up to uh you know we've hit past five o'clock um, and so uh, we're sort of rounding off. And I know as I was presenting, I didn't get to see all of your comments too much. So I'm going to uh, take a look and I'm going to make sure that I, I dig back in and see if I can answer some of them if I didn't get to them or anything. Um, but definitely, if you're looking for our memorials, archive.org is a really good place. And you might find something great coming to find my past at some point soon as well. They're really useful. Um, but uh, that's the place to look. Um, definitely take uh, the bits of things that you need from this and look back, pause it, look for the different elements that we talked about if you're trying to work something out. And then online, there are lots of glossaries of these terms that we looked at when we were blazoning, uh, lots of different things that we can use there uh, so we don't have to know everything at once. So hopefully this has given you a good guide and hopefully this has broken down a few myths and legends and, and put you in a firmer footing of what our ancestors looked like in what they were wearing and uh, to make you feel a little better about perhaps what you uh, have at home. And um, then, of course, um, giving you a whole new uh, world of possibility when it comes to... Uh, tartans and clans and, and your own coats of arms so thanks very much for joining and um hopefully we'll see you soon i think there's a really good session as well coming uh tomorrow with jen as well our final pass friday and something exciting uh, that i know is being prepared so uh, you don't want to miss that either so uh, that'll be the same time tomorrow uh, look forward to that and look forward always to our wonderful great new records uh have a great weekend and uh, i'll hopefully see you again very time soon take care bye bye